Good evening. Uh, thank you so very much for joining us uh, tonight. Um, as we learn more about AB 1819, the Stop Foreign Influence in California Elections Act, and why it is such critical legislation, and uh, what we as activists can do to make it law. Um, I'm Michelle Sutter of Movi Money Out Voters In. We're the California sponsors of the bill. And I'll be guiding us through this one hour program with our extraordinary panel of experts and lawmakers. Um, before we start, uh, a few notes about the format. The Q&A is open for your questions. And we expect to have some time before the end of the hour to address them. Uh, but at the completion of the hour, some of us will be remaining for another half an hour to answer questions we were unable to get to and to get very specific about the steps that will be required to persuade our California legislature that there should not be any foreign money in California elections and that AB 1819 needs to become law. So with that, <clears throat> let's meet our panelists. Um, we're thrilled to be joined by the bill's author, uh, California Assembly Member Alex Lee. Um, we expect momentarily um, Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland, who has introduced the federal version of this bill, uh, HR 6283 into the House of Representatives. We also have um, former Seattle City Council President Lorena Gonzalez, who led the effort to make this uh, election law in Seattle. Um, San Jose City Council Member David Cohen also joins us. He is leading the effort on this legislation in San Jose. And of course, um, Free Speech for People President John Boniface, who is championing this legislation in states around the country and provides Movi with our legal backup for which we are extremely grateful. Um, and with that, Assembly Member Lee, let's start with you. Um, you are the author of AB 1819, uh, which we expect will have its first hearing in the Assembly Elections Committee on April 27th. Um, can you please tell us about the Stop Foreign Influence in California Elections Act um, and whatever uh, came over you to um, introduce this terrific bill. Thank you so much, Michelle, and thank you all for being here, especially to Congressman Jamie Raskin, who I just saw just joined. I know it's very late on the East Coast, so I thank you for joining us at this late hour. Um, but we introduced Assembly Bill 1819 with Free Speech for People and Movie um, Money Out Voters In because there is a glaring loophole right now for foreign influence, uh, foreign influence to seep into our elections. And that's through what's called foreign influenced corporations. Now, very much like the federal uh, initiatives, this, well, without going into that first, I would just say, um, so by, by well-established federal and state laws, foreign actors, whether they be states, corporations, or entities are barred from contributing to elections. But there is a way in which that influence and that money can lead into California elections or indeed federal elections. And much like the federal efforts that Congressman Raskin himself is also championing, is we are going to say that if a corporation is, is owned 1% by a foreign owner, that's in the totality of, of its ownership of its stocks, 1% or 5% agger by foreign owners, it is considered a foreign influence corporation, in which case they cannot spend in California elections. Now, if 1% sounds really low because we're used to majority rule, think about it this way. The big, big corporations that exist today, the ones you can probably think of that are household names, they're worth billions and billions of dollars in, in net worth. Owning 1% of it as one individual means you have millions of dollars, if not more, in shares. And that's more than enough to call up the CEO. And frankly, that's the, the CEOs and the boards, frankly, will know who these people are because they are big players. So think about in that sense where it's a big, big pool of investors and those few that are very big fish that have a 1% or more hold an inordinate amount of power. So it's not just about a traditional majority rule kind of sense to it. And it's important now more than ever because we are in a, a unfortunately, an age of... Um, global turmoil, and we have also a business environment 
that is highly globalized. In 1982, foreign investors owned just 5%, 5% of all US corporate equity, 1982. And now, and by 2019, 40% of it is owned by foreign investors, 40%, that's, that's two in five. So that's, we've really jumped in it. And that's also because there's such interest from foreign investors, venture capitalists, and also even states themselves to transfer their wealth into something that has seemed safe, that's for, that, uh, that seems safe and foreign to them, but is American capital. And that's where a lot of it is hedging in there. And that same influence and that same investment translates into policy that we see today here in California. And that's why it's so important that we maintain the integrity of our elections and our democracy. Thank you, Assemblymember Lee. Yes, it, the integrity of our elections, our sovereignty, and our national security. Let me turn now to uh, Congressman Jamie Raskin. Congressman, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you have introduced this bill federally. And when I speak to people, they say, wait a minute, isn't it already illegal for foreign money to be in uh, US elections? So what's going on? How did this happen? First, thank you for having me, uh, Michelle. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, Assemblymember Alex Lee, thank you so much for inviting me. Hello uh, to John Boniface and to Councilman Cohen. I'm um, really happy to be with all of you guys tonight. Um, you're right. Uh, Alex was pointing this out. I mean, um, you know, people people can go to jail if they accept $500 from someone from a foreign country. Um, they can go to jail. Someone, you know, if they knowingly accept $250 from uh, a foreign citizen, right? And yet there's a loophole which allows hundreds of millions of dollars to, uh, to come in um, and to control corporations or be substantial uh, forces in corporations or uh, to be big enough to influence things. And, um, you know, as Alex was saying, you can have a multi-billion dollar corporation where someone owns 1%, which is several hundred million dollars, and they're able really to have a powerful influence in terms of um, what this company does, including creating dark money campaigns to undermine American democracy. Now, the general problem, of course, is corporate dark money generally. Um, it was Citizens United that opened up um, you know, this huge loophole in American politics, allowing corporations to spend to the heavens um, and to do it in a disguised and uh, you know, underground way. Um, and that's a very serious problem when we like to think that the one redeeming feature of our campaign finance regime, which is so shot through with inequality and injustice, is at least there's transparency. Here, there's not even transparency. Um, and it doesn't take much Certainly with millions of dollars, you can inject a lot of poison into the political bloodstream of America. We saw Vladimir Putin do that through the social media in the 2016 campaign, not just the cyber espionage and the cyber sabotage against the DNC and Hillary Clinton and everything, but also just putting millions of dollars worth of uh, hateful messages in, messages that were racially and religiously and ethnically and ideologically uh, divisive and polarizing. Um, so we got to try to get a hold of this problem. But we're, all we're saying is, if we're really going to have a wall of separation between American democratic sovereignty and our elections, and foreign influence and foreign money, uh, it doesn't make sense to say somebody can go to jail for accepting a $500 contribution or a $1,000 contribution from one person. And yet, foreign corporations and foreign government controlled corporations um, can gain influence in domestic corporations in America and help to spend millions or tens of millions of dollars to skew the outcome of our elections. So I'm very excited about what uh, Assemblyman Lee is doing in California. Um, and uh, I'm psyched to hear about what's going on, I think, in Seattle uh, before I've got to go tonight. And I'm hoping that we will be able to uh, pass here in Congress the Get Foreign Money Out of U.S. Elections Act, which uh, I've introduced um, and um, 
for which I think we've got about a dozen uh, colleagues who've already joined on as co-sponsors for. We're excited about that too, and we'll try to help you with California members. Just one more question before you go, Congressman Raskin. Didn't uh, Justice Stevens in his dissent uh, warn about this loophole that, the, that Citizens United was creating and call on Congress to fix it? As very much so. I mean, he saw precisely that Citizens United would open up this loophole because after all, um, the law governing what the domicile of a corporation is varies from state to state, but it generally just has to do with where you register the company, but it doesn't have to do with what percentage of your shares are owned by foreign corporations or foreign governments or what have you. Um, and so he saw it and also President Obama saw it, I think just you know, a few days after Citizens United, he got up at the State of the Union address and said that the court had just opened up the floodgates for foreign interests to funnel cash directly into American political campaigns. And all of that has come true. Yeah, it's true. And that was the moment where Justice Alito said not true, but of course it was true and we're paying the price for it now. Thank you so you mean much. Justice Alito didn't tell the truth? <laughs> You know, I don't know if he was uh, flat out lying or if they were naive. Yeah. Um, well, it was, it was symbolic speech because he didn't speak. He just shook his head. Right. Yeah, right. So, yeah. I don't think he's been back in the chamber since then. Yeah. But anyway, thank, thank you for so having much. Me, everybody. We're, we're delighted to see you. I know you've been really busy um, today. Yes. Yes. All right. Good evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Um, and now we'll turn to um, former Seattle City Council President Lorena Gonzalez. Ms. Gonzalez, we're delighted to have you here. Um, and you uh, are responsible for being the only city in the nation where this is now law. Um, can you tell us a bit about how that happened and um, what the change was uh, between the 2019 cycle and the 2021 cycle once that bill um, was in effect? Absolutely. Well, thanks, Michelle, for um, having me. Just making sure my audio is coming through okay. Sounds okay, great. 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 Well, thanks to, to John and uh, Assemblymember uh, Lee, and nice to see Councilmember um, Cohen here. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. Greetings from the city of Seattle. And, um, you know, I had an opportunity to work with John and our local uh, movement organization here. Um, and, and we really worked for about a year and a half to address the issue of uh, foreign money in our local elections. And, and I just want to start off by saying that um, I'm not just saying hello from a beautiful, ecological, um, environmentally sound, sustainable city of Seattle. I'm also saying hello from the city of Seattle, which is the home to the largest, richest, wealthiest corporation in the world. Um, some folks might know who they are, Amazon. And uh, in, in, in our um, experience here in the city of Seattle, what happened and what really created the movement and the incentive for us to act locally was that in our 2019 Seattle City Council elections in which seven out of nine seats were up for election, uh, Amazon dropped $1.5 million. That's $1.5 million in a local city council election to intentionally buy the city council. And this is on the heels of the fact that we were passing legislation that promoted worker unionization, that promoted better labor standards, that fought for things like paid family leave, but most importantly, for a more equitable local tax, tax system in the city of Seattle that would require corporations like Amazon and others, including Google and Facebook. Um, I know that Council Member Cohen probably recognizes a lot of these names as well, um, to, to really, you know, to really pay their fair share and to support things like affordable housing, solutions to homelessness, uh, a better public, better public safety and more livable communities. And so they clearly didn't want to be those uh, fair partners in those solutions. And that's why they dropped $1.5 million literally on the, le on, the, on the eve of ballots arriving in um, people's mailboxes 
in uh, the city of Seattle. So um, that really created the foundation and the why and the energy around mobilizing a very diverse set of um, activists to really make the case as to why the city of Seattle needed to take swift action to ban foreign influenced corporations uh, from engaging in our local um, local elections. So we were able to do that. It took us about a year. And um, uh, funny enough, uh, we passed, that was the first law that the city council unanimously adopted and passed in January of 2019. I unfortunately, as John may recall, missed the final vote on my own bill uh, because I went into labor with my first baby. <laughs> so, um, so on that Monday, I got elected council president and, uh, and the following Monday, we passed, uh, we passed a man on foreign influence corporations being into influence our, our elections. And I was really proud of the fact that we had unanimous support to do that. And I'll tell you that the difference has been significant. And, um, you know, that was in 2012. Uh, 2020, and we did have an election cycle in 2021 where um, where our chamber, our local chamber, actually chose to not um, engage in the city council elections for the first time in its history since it started to engage in elections. And in large part, that is because the foreign influenced corporations that used to bankroll its PAC were no longer able to contribute to its PAC as a result of the law that we worked with local activists to pass um, uh, in the city of Seattle. And so um, while we still saw a lot of PAC activity, it was within the bounds of what we think the law says, which is that um, it is from you know local people who are actually people, not corporations, um, engaging in our elections. And so while we um, you know still have some work left in the city to reduce the influence of super PACs, we have I think successfully curbed um, the engagement of foreign influenced corporations in the city of Seattle, thanks to thanks to a lot of the the groundwork that John and others uh, provided us um, in, in advance. So we're really, we're really excited to see that this is um, uh, catching on and that Assemblymember Lee is leading the charge in California and Councilmember Cohen in San Jose and really want to thank you all for the opportunity to share with you sort of the why in Seattle and look forward to continuing to support the efforts nationally to make sure that we once and for all get foreign influenced corporations out of our elections. Thank you so much. And I know you have to go shortly. And if I might just circle back to a couple things to highlight that you spoke about. One, um, what the uh, what Amazon had been seeking to uh, uh, squash in Seattle, which were worker protection and environmental regulations and all of those things. And when you think of that in terms of um, foreign influenced corporations, those foreign investors don't care about the quality of life in Seattle, which is another reason why we really want to remove them um, from our elections. Um, and I'm also curious, and I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you because it came up in Council Member Cohen's hearing um, in San Jose, where there was a tremendous amount of concern that, um, that, that the city was going to be sued. Um, and um, did Amazon sue you? They did not. Um, and there were a lot of overtures about it. And I think it's because the foreign influence component of the legislation is, um, is an obvious loophole that needs to be addressed in local elections. Um, you know, I think they were much more concerned about their ability to engage in super PAC activity and how that could impact, um, you know, going up to the U.S. Supreme Court and challenging Citizens United. Uh, but ultimately, uh, they complied with the law and have, uh, you know, in spite of a lot of a lot of um, grandstanding and bluster during our own process, uh, none of their threats of litigation came to fruition. Now, we were lucky to also have a city attorney at the time elected, uh, democratically elected city attorney who was uh, very clear that he was ready and willing to defend uh, the law and to make sure that that the intent of the legislation would be implemented and defended appropriately in in court. And so um, 
but in our case, we we did not see um, you know promises of litigation come to fruition. Thank you so much. Um, as uh, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson uh, reminded us last week, balancing motherhood with public service um, is uh, a real uh, balancing act. And um, we thank you for <laughs> being with us. And we know you have that toddler uh, to go attend to. So um, we'll look forward to speaking with you again. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Absolutely, Michelle. Thank you, everyone. And much luck. And sorry that I have to duck out early, but it's uh, in the middle of a two-year-old toddler Indeed. time routine. So yeah. thank you, everybody. We, we get it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, now uh, we're going to uh, move into a more California-specific um, portion um, and the um, uh, getting down to um, nuts and bolts of uh, of um, AB 1819, but because we are running a little bit ahead of schedule, I wanna go to you, Council Member um, Cohen, about what just happened in San Jose last week. Um, what prompted you to offer this motion before the City Council? And also, um, we were expecting a close vote and it was not a close vote. So congratulations there. And can you tell us how you did it? I can't necessarily uh, speak to the thinking of my colleagues on the council, but I'm very appreciative that uh, we were able to make a strong case. But I, I, I want to thank, obviously, other members of this panel for laying the groundwork for that. Um, having a model in Seattle, um, I know, uh, you know our council member Gonzalez has already logged off, but I wanted to obviously thank her for showing us what can be done and how it can be done and spending that year and a half, um, you know, doing a lot of the heavy lifting that then we didn't have to do in San Jose and we could uh, uh, learn from that and have it as an example. Our, our, some of our count, my fellow council members are very uh, um, litigation averse. So given that they had a successful two year run so far in Seattle without litigation was I, was I think a good um, selling point. But, you know, I mean, our, our motivations are very similar to what we heard from Seattle and others. Um, our council, we, we have an ever escalating um, arms race in uh, San Jose. Um, in our campaigns that are getting more and more expensive every year. And a lot of that, a lot of that is uh, independent expenditure money um, that's already hard to trace and hard to track. Um, and we know for a fact that obviously we, we have a lot of these, um, a lot of corporation headquarters or, or um, within our general orbit, if, if not in San Jose, um, that, that get involved in these races. But this isn't all about huge companies, but there's other businesses as well. And we know of cases in California, um, not just with large companies trying to influence policy in local cities, but um, you know how, how shell corporations can be created by uh, foreign investors. And those are even the more, sometimes the more insidious uh, cases um, where you know, a shell corporation that's incorporated in the US, but has a large foreign ownership um, is able to uh, in, uh, influence local elections by pro providing money or creating its own independent expenditures. And while we haven't had that happen yet in San Jose, we still know about it in other parts of the state and, and don't want it to happen in San Jose. Right. Um, so um, you know, once we got over, you know, one of the other things that was a big hurdle in San Jose was that whole question of uh, what does it mean to be a foreign investor, given that San Jose is, has such a large immigrant community um, made up of a lot of legal uh, residents who were born in other countries who are not citizens of the United States, uh, we just had to do some work to explain to people that this wasn't applying to them. It was applying to people who live overseas and don't have a vested interest in in the success of our local community here. And so I, you know, those are the those are the motivations, and and uh, we had a good model to build off of, knowing that Seattle had done it, and being able to say let's use the Seattle model. Um, and uh, I was very pleased that we got that uh, what ended up being a nine to one vote in the council last week, yes. so worked yeah, out. Thank you so much. Yes, and we're running into some of those same questions um, in the California legislature about uh, um, foreign individuals who live here as opposed to foreign individuals who, who live abroad and, and the difference um, right. there. So I thank you um, for that. So um, if I may um, turn, I think to, well, I, I, John, do you want to um, 
go into some of the um, uh, assembly member, uh, council member Cohen spoke about the LLCs, which I think we've seen a lot about those kinds of investments um, in the news lately. Um, the, the various Russians who create shell companies to contribute. Do you want to um, talk a bit about, about that threat um, before we go into AB 1819 a little bit more? Sure, and thank you, Michelle, for hosting us. And it's great to be with Assemblymember Lee and Councilmember Cohen, and our other distinguished guests. Uh, I, you know, I think that what really this is about is ensuring American self-government, and that includes ensuring that we, the people uh, in this country, are the ones uh, who are governing, not foreign actors. We saw in 2016, obviously, the impact of foreign interference in our elections via the Russian government directly. But there are, as you have highlighted, Michelle, other ways in which uh, Russian oligarchs uh, can influence our elections through the corporate form, subverting existing federal law that bars foreign nationals from spending money directly or indirectly in our elections. Airbnb is, is one example of a company that has had significant ownership uh, by a venture fund owned by a, a Russian oligarch. And that company, of course, has tried to engage with its corporate general treasury funds in elections around the country to prevent the regulation of its industry. Uh, I think now, uh, you know, going into this cycle, we're going to see, unfortunately, more potential efforts in light of the national security issues at stake and what's happening globally and in, in Ukraine, there's going to be, I think, more potential ways in which Russian oligarchs in particular may try to subvert that federal law and influence our elections through the corporate form. So it has those national security implications, but it's not, of course, solely a question of Russian oligarchs. This is a question for the 98% of the S&P 500 that are multinational actors on the global stage, all of which those 98% have significant foreign ownership. Our partner at the Center for American Progress has done that analysis showing that under the kind of bill that Assembly Member Lee has introduced, that Council Member Cohen is advancing, uh, these companies would be defined as foreign influence, having at least 1% single stock ownership from a foreign investor or 5% in the aggregate. And as Assembly Member Lee has said, a 1% single stock ownership is a significant ownership of a multinational Fortune 500 a company. You get the CEO on the phone, you have the ability to introduce a shareholder resolution, you have significant influence. Uh, and, and this is the kind of influence that now pervades the bulk of the S&P 500, and they are trying to influence our elections around the country. Yeah, and with no concern for how Americans are living their lives, right? It's a, it's a profit and control um, idea. Yeah, um, you know, what I say about this too is that, um, you know, our, the, the framers uh, of our democracy disagreed about a lot, but they did not disagree at all about the threat of foreign influence um, to our sovereignty um, and increasingly our national security, um, it would seem. So um, it really is um, a, a critically important um, piece of legislation that uh, we think will transform California elections. Um, and it's going to be um, a, a very heavy lift. So, um, Assemblymember Lee, um, I know that uh, the legislature last year um, passed a bill that was uh, unanimous in both chambers um, that prohibited, um, and John, maybe you can weigh in on this too as to, as to why it, it, it is the bill that it is. So it prohibited, um, foreign governments, foreign corporations, and foreign individuals 
from participating in California elections. It was unanimously passed, so the legislature clearly understands that foreign money is not something that we want in California elections, but because they did not close this Citizens United loophole, um, ac actually all three of those categories of, in, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, the, both the governments, the foreign corporations and the foreign individuals can still um, participate um, in California elections. Um, so, John, can you talk a, a bit about why that bill, which was AB 319, for those who are following along at, at home, um, didn't really accomplish the job that it set out to do? And then, Assemblyman Lee, if you can come back with why you then have um, introduced a bill to close the loophole. Sure. I mean, I think the, the fact is, is that what we're, we're aiming to do uh, with this bill that that bill does not do is address the foreign influence corporate spending piece. Um, and- Of US uh, corporations that are foreign influenced. Correct, yeah. correct. Um, I mean, it is certainly the case that uh, foreign governments uh, are, are to be prohibited from spending money in our elections. Foreign nationals directly or indirectly are prohibited. That's federal law already. Uh, the point here is that there is this loophole as you've highlighted, Michelle, that came out of Citizens United and just to further highlight the point that was expressed earlier uh, in the exchange with Congressman Raskin, when President Obama gave his State of the Union address right after the Citizens United ruling, he spoke during that address about the ruling and chastised the justices seated in front of him for having issued the ruling saying it would lead to foreign influence in our elections. And that's when Justice Alito famously broke decorum, shook his head, and mouthed the words, that's not true. But unfortunately, President Obama's prediction has proven to be true. And what he was speaking about was specifically this loophole in which now foreign investors can subvert federal law that bars their influence in elections by using the corporate form. And that's why Assemblymember Lee's bill and Council Members uh, Cohen's bill is so, are so important uh, for ensuring that American self-government is preserved. Exactly, thank you. And um, this for the activists who are here, and I know we're gonna bring you in in a bit. Um, this is something that we very much want to highlight was that they understood this threat to be a real threat. And yet because they didn't close the loophole, they did not finish the job. Um, and that will be um, part of the case that we, um, that we make to them. And so, um, Assemblymember Lee, <laughs> I know that um, I know that we're facing a um, a, a big mountain here, mm -hmm. um, and we want to help you in um, any way that we can. Um, what are the things that you would tell us going forward as we? activists um, work to get this bill passed. Mm -hmm. Certainly, thank you, Michelle. And I just also wanna say Council Member Cohen is my personal council member in San Jose where I live. So there oh, must there be a in our in our area where we're all on the same page about it. Um, but I think it's exciting that we could start at every level, right? And I think it's also for the activists on the call listening, it has to be incredibly heartening to hear that Seattle took on Amazon, one of the biggest corporations in the entire world right now, and they did not sue them. Right. So if we hear these sorts of fear mongering that happens then, if Amazon didn't do it then, and they were afraid of losing out if it really went to Supreme Court, why not California where we can be the fifth largest comment? Why not San Jose, which is the 10th largest city in the country? We can certainly make a big tent in it. And also an important thing is, I think there's also some purposeful uh, confusion about this, about the idea about foreign actors, which are like governments, uh, corporations, or investors, right? And the difference between foreign citizens, right? We in San Jose and my Bay Area district, which is actually an API major Asian American majority district, welcome gladly all sorts of folks from every walk of life, from every corner of the world to come here and settle here. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, just as John said, people who live overseas and realistically, the kind of what people we're talking about probably uh, have their mountain home in Switzerland and they are probably you know, dumping lots and lots of money into the stock market right now so they can have safe growth of their investments, right? It's not 
hardworking immigrants across here from Latin America or folks who come from Asia to become our educators. These are very, very different folks. And that it's also recognized in our bill. And why it's important that we need to pass this bill and why I need your help is because there is an uphill fight. Uh, Amazon and those folks know that if we pass this but bill and do something like Seattle, which has basically effectively iced them out of the, um, in some ways, effectively iced them out of some political processes, which they have huge, uh, over, overwhelming uh, influence in, like uh, council member, former council member Gonzalez said, is they spent over a million dollars just on a local council election. Now in San Jose, I think we spent a lot more money than that just because California were like, I don't know what's going on, but we really overblew our elections and the uh, council code will know more about that. But um, it's really important to know that that's kind of odds we're up against. Corporations do not want to lose their foothold in our democracy. Do they not? Especially those who have to answer to uh, big investors overseas, whether they be of the Russian oligarch kind or of another state investment fund kind. They want to be able to return that investment. And what does that mean to American residents here? It means they can extract as much profit as possible, right? Cutting labor standards, cutting quality of products, vertical mergers that destroy other businesses, even other businesses. It's very important. And, and why buying up our housing stock. And buying up our housing stock, exactly. And why that's important is because the profit is on the line, right? It's not the good of the society. Um, I remember often, I hope it's the right company, but Exxon, the CEO, famously said that I am not an American corporation. I am at the whims of my investors, right? I, 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 and I don't I, make I, decisions based on what's best for America. There you go. You remember Chilling sure. comment. Excellent. And that's how it is. Yeah. So that's the kind of odds we're up against. Right now, we're hoping to have our bill heard on April the 27th, but it is not guaranteed. So uh, you'll get more information about how to be activated, how to have your voice heard. But I really urge you to find who your state assembly member is throughout the state, especially if you live in California, and really write to them. Or write to the members that uh, we want you to hear from and why it's so important that if California is able to accomplish this, maybe we see this nationally, it grows from one city to one city, one city, one state to national is so important. So we really need you to find your local legislator and call them up, tell them why it's important. And especially in a time like this of great uncertainty, why it's important we have uh, American integrity in our elections. Thank you. And we'll get to that um, a little bit later. John, I want to turn to you for a sec about um, how AB 19 would be enforced um, and possibly even because um, I think we've, we're doing pretty well on time. Um, speak to uh, why it is. Uh, um, Council member um, Gonzalez alluded to why perhaps Amazon didn't sue. I think she was heading towards Bloom and V FEC, but perhaps you could um, tell us a little bit about that as well and why that might have chilled their um, lawsuit uh, uh, fervor. Sure. So first on the question of how this law would be enforced, it includes a provision that requires the CEO of a company that wants to make general treasury fund political expenditures in any particular election in California to file under penalty of perjury a sworn statement that it is not a foreign influenced corporation after due inquiry done by the company. Uh, that kind of statement, of course, if it's false, uh, could lead to prosecution of the CEO. So there's going to be a, a self-enforcement, if you will, mechanism within this law for those companies that want to still engage in making general treasury fund expenditures, they're going to have to demonstrate via that declaration that they are not a foreign influence corporation. If they determine through due inquiry that they are, that they have at least 1% single stock ownership, or 5% in the aggregate. And Harvard Law Professor John Coates, who's one of the key endorsers of this bill, a, a nationally known corporate law expert, makes clear in testimony he provided to the Seattle City Council that corporations can in fact do this in a relatively straightforward way to determine whether or not they have a foreign ownership of, at those levels. So if they determine that they do, they're not gonna be able to truthfully have their CEO assign that kind of statement. Now, if after the filing of these kinds of declarations with the state, information comes to light uh, that in fact the company is a foreign influenced corporation, then the matter goes over to the California State Attorney General's office for investigation and potential
prosecution of the CEO. And it's, it's very important to note that, you know, this is not as if a, a company is asked in the, in the general sense to, to file a declaration. It's done with the CEO signature under pain of penalty of perjury. And, that, and that's what makes it, I think, uh, particularly uh, helpful to enforce. Uh, the other point on this is there's no extra burden being placed on state officials and state authorities to investigate every single time a corporation is making expenditures, but only when, in fact, there's information that comes to light uh, that they think uh, demonstrates that kind of declaration was a false one. As for the, the legal question, I, you know, I think that one answer certainly could very well be that Amazon uh, decided it didn't want to go up against the city of Seattle on this law. It may also be to be fair that they're looking at whether trend here and multinational actors are as well. But we at Free Speech or People uh, are, are quite confident on the constitutional defensibility of this law. And Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe is one of those who's also endorsed this and has, uh, in, in various different settings, including in Seattle, presented testimony about it. And it does go directly to that case you referenced, Bloom and VFEC. It was two years after the Citizens United ruling issued by the Supreme Court that upheld the longstanding federal prohibition barring foreign nationals from being able to spend money directly or indirectly in our elections. It's worth noting that that ruling, Bloom and VFEC out of the Supreme Court, was upholding a DC Circuit Court of Appeals ruling written by then Judge Brett Kavanaugh that talked about the importance of preserving American self-government for justifying that law. And, and so we do see uh, even this current Supreme Court upholding this kind of law for that very same principle of preserving American self-government. Right. It goes back to the framers being, you know, in, uh, in uh, uh, utter agreement about the threat of foreign influence. Um, where would we be if we suddenly decided that that's not even part of our legal structure um, any longer? So we, we do think we're on um, very firm footing here. Um, and to your previous point, John, about the um, the CEO signing on penalty of perjury, right? We, we are in fact creating a new crime in, in California, um, which is significant. And right after um, Congressman Raskin introduced his bill, there was a very screedy article written in the Washington Examiner that went, you know, what CEO would ever sign this document, right? Saying that they weren't foreign influenced. Um, so um, uh, it will be, um, Again, it will it will be transformational. I think in California when we when we do um, pass this bill. So um, now um, I don't know, um, Assemblymember Lee and Councilmember Cohen, if you really have an answer to this question. But we'd love to hear, you know, what your vision is for what our elections will be like um, when AB eighteen nineteen is in place, and in your case. Um, Congress, uh, Council Member Cohen, when um, when your motion becomes law, I think you have another step. I think you've sent it out to your council legislative analyst and your city attorney, and it will come back at some point. Maybe you can address that first, and then we'll go to the second point. Yeah, sure. I, so I, our process is that we take that first vote, directing the city attorney to write the ordinance. Um, They've, the direction is that they'll use the Seattle ordinance as a guide, so I hope it won't be a lengthy process. Um, they'll, they'll do a little bit of analysis in, in that, but they'll come back with an ordinance, and usually when they come back with the ordinance at that point, it's, it's uh, passed along through our consent calendar, so there shouldn't be a second um, debate over it. It, will, it, it usually passes um, with just a simple Along the same lines. Vote, um, you know, and whether somebody, you know, pulls it off to to discuss it again, I you know, I doubt that. So I think really that first vote was the vote that gets it through. We just have to, you know, we'd like to have it in place in time for the general election this year, which when the cycle starts on June, the, the first Wednesday in June, we have a primary in June, which is happening right now. And so it's, it's not that that rule is not in place yet. But, you know, we expect the larger money to come in on the independent expenditures for the general election. And so um, 
I'm hoping it'll come that the ordinance will come back in the next month. So it will have the 60 days after the ordinance passes for um, before it becomes law. So it can be law by the beginning of June. Um, and, and, you know, the hope is that this will, um, you know, I, the, you know, they're, they're, we'll see what kind of effect it will have on our local elections. Um, we, we've had a bit of a shakeup as far as where the independent expenditures are coming from in our city right now, based on fallout from the really over the top spending that happened in the last election cycle. Um, so some of the groups like the chamber who were a big player have dissolved their packs. And so we're not sure exactly how this year is going to look and where the money is going to be coming from. But obviously, we would prefer that money coming into our election was coming from people who have a vested interest in the success of our local community. Um, and that's what will be the outcome of this when it passes. Um, and um, we'll, we'll see if we'll be able to measure an effect. You know, as I point out to people who are concerned about, about this, this doesn't stop individuals who are executives at these companies from contributing their own dollars if they'd like to. Um, they are American, most, most likely citizens, or at least not their legal residents who you know, still have the right to participate in our democracy. So um, this just means that corporate treasuries won't be open um, for the large sums of money that sometimes flow in for certain ballot initiatives or uh, elections. And we, you know, we'll, we have a mayoral election this year, so we'll be able to at least know that the money's coming from uh, people with that local interest. Yes. And John, isn't, I mean, a, a corporation can have its own corporate PAC, right? That takes contributions from employees, but just not treasury funds. That's right, that's exactly right. Corporate PACs are not gonna be barred under this. That, that's not to say, obviously, that the longer range work on money and politics ought to include dealing uh, with leveling the playing field further. Uh, and there are other reforms out there that are critical for that. But in terms of this particular legislation, it's addressing the corporate general treasury funds that get spent by foreign influence corporations. Exactly. And I'll just add that, you know, as far as individual can candidates raising money, we have campaign contribution limits in the city. So individual contributions can't be very large as it is in San Jose. Um, so most of the influence was through the independent expenditures. And I'm sure many of us who've run for office in San Jose have received periodically a $600 check from a corporation with some foreign interest in it. Um, but that's not going to change the dynamic of candidates raising money very much because of that six to $700 limit that it, for individual contributions. Those apply to corporations just like they do to individuals. This is the money that goes into the independent expenditures, which are often flooding and really um, dominating the amount of money candidates spend on their own in their campaigns. Yeah, ballooning the independent expenditures. So it would make a large dent in the amount of money that IEs have, which I should think Assemblymember Lee is something that the legislature um, could get behind. I, I know they um, are, uh, you know, not, not big fans of, of the IEs. No, I, think I don't think muted. many politicians oh. are fans of IEs at all. Yeah. How's that? Yeah, but, I don't think many politicians are fans of IEs until uh, they see it benefit them, right? Right. <laughs> That's a, the thing I, I want to re-emphasize what John and, and Council Marcon are saying too, is this approach is comprehensive. Just like a true 100% foreign-based, foreign, -based, foreign uh, entity through and through, it cannot spend in uh, independent expenditures, PACs, direct contributions, ballot measures, all of it. It's a comprehensive ban that is upheld by the standards of this country for a very long time. And that's why it's so good at not just closing a loophole, but really building a whole new wall that should have been there in the first place, right? It's not just plugging a hole. It, it's comprehensive in that sense. And that's why it's, it's so impactful. So can and I would, Yeah. <laughs> and I would hope that California, of course, statewide, we have this. And Council Marco and Neo, feel free to have city staff look at our bill to use as a model. Like, I mean, it's gonna hopefully be California law, so hopefully we can be consistent with it in the same way. Um, but I really hope that this gets us further to a people-centered approach. There's a lot we can learn from Seattle, frankly, and I'm gonna be working on this too, is publicly financed elections that empowers individual voters. They have spending caps. Not every city has spending caps the way, uh, or contribution caps, I should say, the same way that uh, San Jose has. But it's really important to balance it back to the people. So for most folks who are, if you've ever donated to a campaign, you probably think about you send a check or you do something online. Uh, that's your one option that you probably 
will ever do. Our corporation, they have a whole menu of options of spending. What this bill will do, and hopefully across country will do, is closing that menu. And just as Councilmember Cohen said, if you're a, a American executive, sure, spend as much as you can fathom out of your own pocket, but don't use the coffers offered to you by consumers that did not sign up to have their money spent this way either, or foreign investors, um, and have that bleed into elections. So I really hope we're going to get into a people-centered election soon. Me too. So Alexandra, are there questions in the chat for our, our panel? Yeah, um, so we have a question about uh, the investment limit set at 1%, uh, why not 0, 5, or 10 uh, shareholding positions in a corporation? Is there a number you believe that will get this bill passed? Uh, if higher, why would this be better or worse? Um, so maybe, uh, John, if- John, you want to take that? Yeah, no, I'm happy to address that. So the default position under federal law for foreign nationals for being able to spend money directly or indirectly is 0%. That is the default position. And this bill uh, arguably is a compromise. It's not setting it at 0%. It's setting it at 1% for single stock ownership and 5% in the aggregate. And as I said, for what uh, John Coates, Harvard Law Professor John Coates has testified to, this is, this is these are the levels at which stock owners, particularly of major multinational companies have significant influence at the 1% uh, level. Uh, again, to get a CEO on the phone to introduce a, threat, a shareholder resolution or even threaten to introduce a shareholder resolution. And that's why uh, it's, it's critical that they be at these levels. I understand the general response from people that might uh, you know, not be steeped in, in corporate law and, and corporate governance to think that these are very low thresholds, but in fact, uh, they're, they're quite significant thresholds for, for foreign ownership. And, and that's precisely why it's critical that they be there. If we put them higher, we're going to not address in the comprehensive ways, as Assemblyman Lee has said, the problem at stake here, which is to end foreign uh, influence in our elections through the corporate form. And John, aren't these the levels at which the SEC has established that influence happens? In a corporation. The, SEC, the SEC has established at the 5% level, uh, that's when the disclosure is required. Uh, but even the even the 1% is well recognized by the business roundtable and by the SEC as the place at which the, the shareholder resolution power exists. And frankly, the business roundtable and the SEC have advocated for lowering uh, right. that threshold below 1% for people to be able to introduce a shareholder resolution. So they recognize the power, even those below 1%. So I, I do think these thresholds are quite defensible and necessary to protect American self-government. Thank you. Alexandra, next question. Yeah. Um, so Assembly Member Lee, maybe uh, you could answer this. So which committee will, will the bill go to first and what Assembly members are currently supporting uh, AB 1819? Yes, yeah, so first it must go to the Assembly Elections Committee, uh, which is chaired by Los Angeles Assembly Member Isaac Bryan. Uh, and we are hoping to have that heard on April the 27th. Um, and the current members that support it as co authors uh, are actually uh, Assembly Member Oshkara of San Jose, who's my Southern neighbor, and uh, Senator Bob Kask, which is also my state senator as well. So it's all our kind of coalition of our corner of the world, it seems. We need um, to do some work down here in SoCal yeah. on this bill, <laughs> right? And it's worth pointing out that um, Assembly Member Lee and Assembly Member Calra are the only two members of the California legislature who do not take corporate money. Um, so we'll be trying to persuade some more. Uh, Alexandra, have you another question for us? I think we yeah. can. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people hear about this bill and they worry that maybe the motivations are, are xenophobic or in some ways it's a xenophobic bill. Can you, uh, and this can be to, to any of, the, of our uh, speakers, can you speak to the intention of this bill in relation to immigrants um, and, and essentially speak to this fear that this is a xenophobic bill? Assembly Member Lee, you wanna take that one? Yeah, I will say, you know, it's a matter of, and I understand the concern of course in the age we're living in, or living in but this is not, case to say we don't want folks from across the world to be here. We're saying folks who are overseas, we don't want 
uh, with no real interest in American society to have undue influence. In, in democratic self-governance and self-determination in democracy, it should be about the residents and the voters and the folks who live in that society. It's a matter of principle. And also I highlight that while we do every now and then talk about specific examples, it's a matter of principle as well. Like for instance, um, we talk about Russian oligarchs, right? Vladimir, Vladimir Potanin from Russia has early investments in Lyft. Another Russian oligarch, Mikhail Kodovsky, has invested over a billion dollars in tech giants such as Twitter and Meta. But also another one that you might not be as primed to think is big and scary is that actually one entity has a stake in 1,900 US companies with an average hold of 1.4% of publicly traded shares and companies, which include like Netflix, Facebook, Microsoft, health insurance, Chevron, all sorts of things. But you wouldn't probably be primed to think they're quote unquote scary is the state, the, the country of Norway, infamously high, um, a strong sovereign wealth fund, which they use their oil wealth to divert, uh, to, to invest in American stocks. So this is not so much about like what we feel about a certain actor or how we feel about it, nor whether you have strong feelings about Russian oligarchs or the, or the sovereign wealth fund of Norway, if you have feelings about it, is it's about the principle of influence. And that's the really matter of it. And prohibiting foreign investors living in foreign countries from participating in US elections. Is that correct, John? Yes, absolutely. I mean, there is already, as we as we discuss, uh, federal law that prohibits anyone who's not a U.S. citizen or permanent resident from making expenditures in U.S. elections, even if they're frankly living here. But when we're talking about the kind of foreign investors in U.S. corporations, these are not uh, people holding green cards living in the United States for the most part. These we're talking about people who are overseas and entities that are overseas that are investing in these multinational corporate actors. Thank you. Um, we've reached the eight o'clock hour. Um, as we've said, uh, everyone who wants to hang around can hang around. Um, and we are, I think, Alexandra, going to um, open up the, the chat and actually um, unmute people as we talk about our very specific next steps for California, as Assemblymember Lee said, we have a hearing um, coming up, we hope, um, on the 27th of uh, April um, in the Assembly Elections Committee. But even to guarantee that we have that hearing, um, we're going to need a real push from activists to help us persuade the committee um, that this is something that Californians care very deeply about. Um, and um, so how should we go about this logistically? Well, uh, just first I wanted to thank so much for Council Member oh, Cohen okay. yes. and Member Lee for, for your time and also your leadership this evening. And uh, we're gonna have a, a little of a, a discussion with the folks who are attending, but um, I wanna thank you all so much and uh, 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 yeah, we're very, very grateful for your leadership. It's inspiring, uh, I guess, this movement across the country. 